So I'm being introduced to new technology, so please bear with me. Apparently, I have control of the clicker via the internet and my phone. Uh, it's the first time I've used this while doing a PowerPoint, so again, please bear with me. Okay, so I'm going to click on the link to 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 the the deck is working. Is the first slide visible? Thank you. So I would like to offer my thanks this morning to the local nations in the territory of whom we are all gathered virtually, or I'm gathered virtually this morning, Ganya, Gehaga, Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And I would also like to offer up thank you to the host city, Montreal, and to the Secretariat of the Quebec Treasury Board for inviting me to participate in this Open Data Summit. And at this time, I would also like to offer my congratulations to Montreal for the work that they've been doing under the Smart Cities banner and in open government, open data in general. Um, the Tunaka Nation and many indigenous nations are also sharing a, a, a very important uh, uh, a work uh, around food security. Uh, and we acknowledge how important it is for us to have access to technology in order to uh, use the various platforms that are available to us. So uh, not only do we need to have the, the uh, um, uh, systems available, but the access through the just the technology itself is something that we're still facing um, challenges in many of our rural and remote communities. I myself am from the Kutunaka Nation. Our traditional territory is in the southeast corner of the province of British Columbia, northwestern Montana, northern Idaho, and into Alberta. The Kutunaka language is an isolate language. It's related to no other language in the whole world. It's one of the most critically endangered languages in Canada, and it is, in fact, one of the 11 language families of Canada. My nation is a small nation population-wise, but a very powerful nation with respect to our assertion of our, and our rights and title. We have a small population now because of many factors, and most significantly, the impacts of smallpox, tuberculosis, and colonization in general. My nation, we were holdouts with respect to settling reserves and being colonized, really. And my great-grandfather, who I feel is really um, inside me, and the reason I do a lot of the work I do. He was in Ottawa in 1916 with a delegation of chiefs from the interior region of BC, asserting Donaka sovereignty. And we've done that ever since. We have not been, we've not felt ourselves to be subject to uh, the Crown's uh, uh, will. We have always, uh, in any way possible, asserted our rights and title. It's been challenging because for the majority of, 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 of the program services and the relationships we have, they're not in one, uh, in a relationship they have are not of the value that we would say is, is, is what's required at this point in time um, as we move back towards uh, um, self-government again. Myself, I've worked for my nation for over 40 years, uh, various positions, but in the past 20 years, primarily the activities that I've been attached to are to enable our governance transition. As the Tunaka Nation has been negotiating a modern treaty under the BC treaty process, we've really um, pushed to break the treaty process into um, what we call the spirit and letter of law. As we know, treaty is a legal agreement. It's an uh, internationally binding agreement. And so for us, it's not to be taken lightly. We've seen what's happened to nations historically when they've signed treaties that are detailing what it is their um, um, rights are. And so we were hesitant to do that. And in fact, our citizens said, no, we will take no less than we have right now, which is our rights and title, which is our sovereignty. Because even though we have to operate under an Indian act, we still, we don't act like Indians, excuse me. So we don't want to end up with, in the future, some clause in our, in our, our, our agreement, our treaty, that would be like the cow and the plow clause of the, the historic treaties. And if you don't know what uh, I'm, I'm talking about there, one of the, the, the historic treaties, of course, has uh, clauses in it that refer to nations getting uh, implements like cow uh, uh, plows to, to, to support um, their farming. 
and that they would get cows and that they would get binder twine and that they would get ammunition and they would get things like that, $5 annuity. Those treaties are honored verbatim. So the letter of those law is still administered the way it was all those years ago when signed. So we know that many of the communities, many of the nations are not farmers. We know that the cow and the plow scenario uh, is something we want to avoid. And so for the Tunaka, it's very important that we focus on spirit and recognition. So in the, in the treaty process, we pushed until we broke the process into those components. And so through our assertions and through much, much negotiation, we're now at a point where the other governments are providing us with some of the recognition that's required for us to actually start functioning as a government. We want our recognition as a distinct society, and we want to have our governments recognized. And we want to be provided with sustainable, predictable, and sufficient resources to work on reconciliation over time. And this, of course, includes data governance. Okay, I'm pressing the button, but nothing is happening. So if somebody else can press the button to advance the slide. Thank you very much. Oh, I think we went too far, perhaps. I apologize for this. Um, I think the clicker's going, there we are. I went very far ahead. Back there we are, excuse me for that. I tapped too many times and there's latency. So I visit Ottawa quite often and I'm sure that many of you have over time and you'll see office buildings there. This particular building as I was visiting one day, I think it's in Tani's pasture. And if you look closely at this image and it's a little difficult on the tiny slide, but there's one window in that sea of probably a thousand or more windows that's shining a slightly different color. And as I was approaching the, the building that day to talk about you know, reporting reform and reducing the reporting burden, and um, I was reminded of that uh, long ago concept that we were exposed to, again, in this, this trajectory towards something, a devolution of services, and it was called the one window approach. And I giggled to myself as I looked up at this big building and saw this one shiny window. And I asked myself, is that the place where we have to go? Is that the place, is that the window? Is that the one window? And so we've seen so many uh, initiatives over time to try to reduce the reporting burden that First Nations uh, face because of the jurisdictional uh, disputes or the lack of jurisdictional recognition, uh, I think, that we're, we're subject to. A lot of people don't know that on reserve, we are federal lands, of course. And so because the Constitution of Canada has not given the federal government the authority for those things of a personal nature, those things exclusively given to the provinces, the, the federal government has to try to create law to actually accommodate all of those different programs and services they deliver to us, or they have to get uh, voted authorities every, every, uh, every year to get spending authority to administer those programs and services to us. So it's been a real challenge um, for as long as I can recall working for my nation for 40 years, and I'm sure that it went on prior to, and it's still going on. And there's a, 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 a very core core uh, uh, thing, I think, that is at, at the heart of all of this. And it seems that, you know, I've watched this occur, and because I've had the privilege of participating in events like uh, Parle Americas and presenting to you know, Treasury Board's transparency uh, conferences, etc., I really uh, understand sort of this dynamic that's there. And I've watched... As, as people, you know, that I know get elected into uh, these positions, uh, MP, uh, even MLA, et cetera. And it's like automatically this, this concept of, of, of a separation of government from civil society. It's like almost like this initial, uh, you can see it almost like an elevation of the, the human. And it's been something that we, it really challenges us as Tunaka people, given that when we understand our roles and responsibilities, it's a real lateral concept. And so the separation of the, 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 the people who make the laws from those who are subject to the laws and the privilege that goes along being an MP or an MLA, it's, it's obvious. And it seems like a lot of times people, they, they respond you know, to the privilege. They move ahead with the privilege and they take full advantage of the privilege. And it's hard sometimes, and I know it's hard, to actually address the responsibilities that they have because we're stuck in this political system. And politics does not necessarily bring good governance. And that, again, is something that's been challenging for us. We've been subject to political will, political whim. So depending upon who's the forming government, we know as First Nations governments that it may be a good thing or not a good thing. 
depending upon how they feel about us. And so I, I've often wondered, you know, maybe we should think about instead of government and civil society, maybe we should bring about the concept of civil government and society so that those governments are maybe thinking more about being respectful, about the humanity, about actually the public good in all the work they do. I, I, I see this election going on and I just, I almost want to go to sleep until it's over because I have fear for what it really means. We don't know. And so it's challenging for us as First Nations to be stuck in this political system that oftentimes does not bring us what we need. Now, did I just click too far ahead again? I'm just going to check, you know, I think we're okay here. When I first became aware of the open government movement, it was about 2013, 14. And I was, it really became aware of it in, in when I started to hear rumors about um, additional data sets or our data being you know, made available in more public uh, uh, forms. And the Transparency Act was you know, being pushed towards us uh, a little later on. And all of these things were starting to happen with respect to you know, this open government concept and making sure that you know, governments were being transparent in their work. And I, I, it really hit me hard to, to think about the data that the federal government had on First Nations people, which is all really much you know, associated with disease, dysfunction, and, 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 and that sort of thing, because that's really what their, their focus is, you know. Indian people are diseased and dysfunctional people, and so we've got to have programs and services to deal with that because the public will get, uh, you know, when things are not right. But... When I really started to explore what was going on inside of that open government agenda, I got a little concerned because when I looked at what the open government plan was saying that came from the open government work, it was really just basically saying to us that, you know, we were program beneficiaries once again. And so the open government plan had nothing in respect to Indigenous people initially, and then it was only after we pushed them. And I absolutely threatened the Treasury Board. And, and, and I'm sorry for doing that, those Treasury Board representatives. But it was for the 2014-15, you know, in, in that period. And then in 2015, in May, I believe it was, there was an open government conference, an open data conference in Ottawa, an international conference. So the world was coming to Ottawa to talk about open government. And so I got in touch with Treasury Board, the, the, the hosts uh, that were coordinating, and I asked, who's, who's going to be there from the Indigenous population? I assumed that we would at least have the local population opening the event, but I found out there was no, no, no mention. None. We weren't even included in the agenda anywhere, not even to give a welcome. And this was about six weeks, eight weeks before the event was going to occur. And so I said to those folks that I was speaking to on the organizing committee, Mm, you know, this is a very important thing. This is a very political thing. And I suggested that they would welcome Gwen Phillips to the event, perhaps. And perhaps I could bring a uh, panel of First Nations people to participate in the event. And I was sort of met with a little hesitation from Treasury Board. And of course, we had no funding. So we suggested to them that I would rally up a group and we would either be inside the building, welcoming the world as a panel to talk about Indigenous data sovereignty from the international perspective, or we would be outside the building, welcoming the world to talk about the absence of inclusion, to talk about the lack of recognition, to talk about... And so it was myself and three dynamic First Nations women that work internationally, three from the United States, Dr. Stephanie Russo Carroll, Dr. Desi Lombear Rodriguez, and Eileen Briggs. I want to thank them again for being able to respond with such short notice and to be such powerful, powerful presenters, true data warriors. So if you look at that first open government plan, they didn't even capitalize the word Indigenous Canadians, right? We're making sure we're getting our benefits. That's basically what's thinking back then. So no recognition of, of really what open government could or, or would do in respect to if the federal government opened their data in the form that it was in relation to all being associated with First Nations dysfunction, that perhaps it wasn't necessarily going to get what we wanted from the public, that perhaps it was going to be telling more stories about First Nations people that were about disease and dysfunction. And where's the stories that talk about the successes? Where are the stories that talk about well-being? There were very few because that's not what the machinery is focused on. 
And so let me try another click and see if it catches me this time. There we are. And so again, um, as we pressured and pressured because we were not going to stop pressuring and we don't stop pressuring, we participate. And even if we have no funding, we participate. We write letters, we, we, we do videos, we do all kinds of things and just put ourselves out there. And I myself have been championing data governance for the Tanakhi Nation since the year 2000. We established that one of the first data warehouse models in British Columbia and Canada, probably, that was actually person centric. So we were looking to bring data from multiple external sources into one environment so we could actually see how well our people were doing. All those years ago, and so along this process, this 20 year, 20 so some years uh, journey, I've been privileged, as I say, to sit at a lot of tables. And it wasn't that long ago, less than 10 years ago, I saw a memo that went from one federal department to another federal department, no departments to be named, that actually said this, that by them doing a client file match, they could, and that is to bring you know, the status Indian numbers together with other data, basically, that they could track the socioeconomic experience of an individual Indian over the past 30 years. When I read that memo, my whole body quivered. I said to myself, is that really what the federal government should be doing? Setting themselves up to track the, my experience over the past 30 years? Is that really the intent of all of this data collection that's going on and opening data from one department to another department and potentially opening data to the world? Now, I was extremely alarmed and so were my colleagues. And I saw this as, as, as big brother to the utmost. And I've got four big brothers, so I know what big brother can do for you. You know, they can do a lot to protect you if their heart is in it, but they can also do a lot to suppress you. They can do a lot to hold you down. And some of us remember the George Orwell big brother concept. So First Nations data champions have continued to provide pressure on the federal and provincial governments because the provincial governments are also doing open data policy. And while the words of the federal plan have changed, and we can see them on the screen here, where they're now talking about nation to nation relationships, they're talking about engaging directly with rights holders. Well, those words are powerful words, but the relationships and processes have not changed. The federal government still puts most of their effort into meeting with the AFN or other organizations, but meeting with a group of leaders at an assembly like that or a provincial or national forum is not engagement with rights holders. Engagement involves meeting nation to nation and government to government with the rights holders of each unique First Nation group in Canada, with each Inuit nation in Canada. Engagement needs to take place on the terms set by the nations themselves. And so this open government plan for 2018-2020 included this bold statement. And they even capitalized Indigenous peoples now. But the federal government has yet to engage with rights holders. Now I've been part of what might have been called their engagement. Um, they asked if they could come to British Columbia and be part of a session we held a couple of years ago. Said, sure. They came, they presented. That's not engagement. They didn't even know what nations were in the room. So when you really understand how important identity is to us, and did you know, for example, that the Indigenous Languages Act that was passed a couple of years ago didn't even identify the language, didn't even contain a list of the languages? Language is the foundation of our nationhood. But the other governments don't understand this yet. I don't even know if Canadians understand this yet. A lot of Francophones understand this. But they don't understand how important language is to our identity in general terms, Canadians. And so they continue to treat it like it's a program. We will offer some money up through a proposal call for you to get some money to you know, put a language program in place. Language is core to identity, core to our value sets. It really informs us. It informs our governance structures. It informs our social systems. It helps us to know what is right, what is not right. So much of who we are is contained in our languages.
And so it's been a lot of push, 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 push over the years to try to get that recognition. And it seems that that voice is being heard as we've collectively started to you know, say the same thing, not just one nation, but two nations, but five nations, but perhaps the 88 nations of Canada speaking the same thing, saying the same things. We are starting to be heard. Now, I'm a grandmother now. I'm getting close to getting the shopper's discounts at the stores. And I've noted, as I've worked for my nation for 40 years, the terms that have been used to describe us, Indians, that's still a legitimate term. There is an Indian Act. We've been natives. We've been Aboriginal. We've been First Nations and now Indigenous. But in truth, none of these terms are actually politically correct. Even though that's been the, you know, the thinking that, oh, we've got to adopt this new label because it's the politically correct label. Well, I'm hoping that every one of you has taken time to look at the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Because that declaration is not just a philosophical pie in the sky sort of aspirational uh, declaration. It is actually real and it is something that is going to be so important as we move forward with our recognition and reconciliation work in Canada and so important to the data sovereignty and open data agenda. So in understanding that the UN DRIP Act actually says that we should not be forced into uh, assimilative processes or, or forced to uh, be part of a, 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 a body politic. We, we should have our own identity. Um, but um, again, you know, and this pandemic has uh, proven to us that there's a lot of work to be done in both the recognition and uh, not just as a nation groups, but the recognition of our governments. So we're called First Nation communities, but we have governments, okay? First Nations are not communities. Communities are places where people live. So First Nations citizens, Dunaka citizens, live in communities. And in fact, Dunaka citizens live in cities, towns, rural, remote regions all over the globe. We are nations of people with unique identities, unique languages, and unique ways of relating to the world. So relationships are broken, and history books don't provide the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This pandemic has once again highlighted the need for timely quality data, and it's also highlighted the lack of access that First Nations governments have to data that is collected by and used by the other governments. In British Columbia, a number of nations pushed and pushed at the provincial government for inclusion as pandemic started to cause, you know, uh, was, was starting to see uh, uh, cases erupting and getting uh, out of control in some of the communities. And we're some rural communities with lack of supports, you know, no services there which would mean potentially flying out 30 or 40 people, maybe even more, to the most the closest urban center or to wherever. And our hospitals were already overburdened. So they demanded to be informed when there were cases that were close by so they could do what governments do, begin to protect their citizens. And so the health sook, working with some other nations, pushed at the provincial government and did manage to get some data sharing agreements in place. But I would call them more information sharing agreements rather than data sharing agreements. And they were very ex explicit. They were very simple agreements to facilitate a particular transfer of information for a particular purpose for a particular time. We still don't have that higher level recognition and we still don't have access to that data that's needed. We're left uninformed and in fact in a vulnerable state. So this lack of recognition is really, as I say, at the heart of all of the challenges or many of the challenges we face as First Nations governments and as Indigenous governments in Canada. Okay, I clicked again, but it didn't move. So I'm afraid to click one more time, but I will do it. There we are. There was a piece of research done quite recently in British Columbia, and you probably are all aware of the horrendous stories uh, that have been, 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 been coming out in the news about the treatment of Indigenous people, um, particularly First Nations people, in healthcare facilities across the country. So in British Columbia, this triggered uh, one of these incidents, a very significant and serious incident, triggered uh, a piece of research to be commissioned by the BC government. 
And it was carried out by an independent research team with some First Nations uh, and Indigenous uh, uh, researchers involved in that process. Uh, Mary Ellen Trapel Lafond, a very well known uh, uh, First Nations woman with a legal background, was the pri uh, principal investigator. This research project resulted in a, 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 a report called the In Plain Sight Report. And this report uh, really looked at anti Indigenous racism in the BC healthcare system. It was probably the most comprehensive uh, uh, survey that was done. There were, I think, over five, I think between five and 7,000 respondents to this survey. And that included people working in the system and the people who had received services from the system. That report uh, come up, uh, committed to, uh, 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 recommended uh, a number of, of, of commitments uh, to be brought from the provincial government. And it recommended that the provincial government commit in that to uh, data governance processes uh, being established that in particular recognized and, and, and gave the uh, um, support to uh, implementation of Indigenous data governance. So it absolutely uh, recognized how critical um, it is for First Nations uh, governments to be the ones who are in, in control of data uh, that allows them to track how well services are, are being performed. So we would want to be interested in looking at environments, services, and relationships, and measuring all of those things against standards that we define for ourselves, or perhaps in cooperation with the provincial governments, so that they are aware of what it is, of course, that we're measuring in these systems. So the Tanaka Nation is wanting to hold the province accountable for the change that's required over time. First Nations will be in control of this data, and for the first time ever, the data that was generated through this provincially commissioned report is not provincially controlled or owned. The data has been set aside to be owned by the Indigenous peoples of British Columbia. And as we move our work forward, there will be a data centre that will be hosting that data, and there will be processes established so that we can longitudinally use that data to make sure that there are changes happening in systems. There is a tripartite data quality sharing agreement in place right now in British Columbia, so that it allows the federal and provincial governments to you know, find the, the First Nations status Indians in their service systems in the provincial environment. But the third party to this agreement is the First Nations Health Council, a political organization prior, which morphed into the First Nations Health Authority. And this is a, a, agreement is over 10 years old, and it, it itself acknowledged that it needed to get to the point where nations themselves were the party in these tripartite data sharing agreements. And that's where we are right now. And so the Tanaka Nation is working with other nations in drafting a tripartite data quality sharing agreement that will position us as Indigenous governing bodies to be receiving data and sharing data with the other governments. Now, it's something that has uh, um, scary to some governments because they see that many nations don't have a lot of capacity, which is absolutely true. But we can create that capacity. And there is work underway now to help us do that. So when we acknowledge where we are right now in this uh, 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 time of change, uh, there was, again, another piece of work being done. And uh, we acknowledge that the uh, UN DRIP, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, has been adopted through legislation, both in British Columbia and recently by Canada. But therein again, <clears throat> it's talking about the rights of Indigenous peoples. It, it recognizes that we have both human rights and Indigenous rights, and they're different. All humans have human rights. Indigenous people's rights are different because we are the ones who are the original owners of a particular land. And the colonization process, of course, has just you know, layered, layered uh, other people's authority on top of ours, but it did not extinguish our authority. So this other piece of research that was done recently by the Office of the BC Human Rights Commission looked at disaggregated demographic data. And I had the opportunity to participate in that process. It included many diverse voices. The final report recommends a framework for applying what's been called the grandmother perspective to data collection and use. And the commission has also recognized the need to establish effective data, indigenous data governance. So this, uh, this report basically both answers and echoes the call to collect disaggregated data to advance human rights, but it cautions because it, it acknowledges that, you know, 
Recognizing that data used inappropriately or out of context can reinforce stigmatization of communities, can lead to individual and community harm. So in other words, basically, this, this framework, this, 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 this report is calling for data that reflects lived experiences of many to allow their stories to be amplified and clearly heard by those in power. But it went further than just giving a report and recommendations. It actually, in the recommendations, proposed what we would call a framework. And this framework that they've proposed is to actually look at, you know, beyond uh, uh, just uh, um, um, some, some, some guidelines for uh, what we should think about. Um, it went so far as to lay out a framework for analyzing our approaches to ensuring our data work met the test of human rights defense. And so we're... Uh, I was, was basically the one who gifted them with the, 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 the um, concept of the grandmother's perspective. And it was, again, acknowledging that my nation does not want to collect data to suppress my people. We do not want to collect data that, that, that continues to perpetuate concepts of dysfunction. We want to focus on wellness, well-being, and we want to collect data because we care. And so moving from that, that concept of having data because it can, it can give me power over somebody or something to acknowledge that it should inform me and it should allow me and, and help me to actually do more in a kind way. So another thing that I mentioned in this, in this research was that we're not measuring race as we're thinking about this work. We're measuring racism, a systems failure. And so in their framework, they recognize purpose the elimination of systemic racism and oppression and the cultivation and maintenance of equity. Process, respectful relationship grounded in community governance. And this is not just about indigenous people. This is about all communities. So as soon as you can identify a community, a group with has been disaggregated to women, ethnic people, any ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that, that group, that community, needs to have some relationship to those people and the processes and the tools that are being used to do that data collection and using that data post. So the tool and looking at disaggregated data and making sure that it's appropriate to be used. So in applying this work, they're actually doing a, another bit of, of, of work right now. And that piece of work that they're doing is to begin to look at a shift from control to care. The other piece of work that they're focusing on, which is a massive piece of work, is to look at an anti-discriminate data act. This anti-discrimination data act would focus on building respectful relationships with marginalized communities to ensure that community needs and voices are meaningfully included in data collection use and disclosure processes. As experts of their own lives, community members are the ones best equipped to identify priorities and risks in potential data collection activities and processes. So I acknowledge that the work that the um, Montreal is doing uh, in their open, uh, open government work in the smart cities and including the populations that have been disadvantaged over time. So my, my, my nation acknowledges that people are not vulnerable. People can be very strong in the right environment and can be made vulnerable in other environments. So we acknowledge how much the environment has to do with an individual's strength and resiliency, and that it's up to us as governing bodies to create the right environments for humans to flourish. And so when we think about Canada and Indigenous populations and nation-to-nation -nation relationships and Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it's a huge philosophical thing we're thinking about. And inside of that, we actually have to understand that there are 88 unique nations in Canada, 88 unique nations, and that includes the Inuit peoples. So when we think about UN DRIP and the application of UN DRIP, we must think about those unique nation entities, identities, excuse me, those identities and the governing bodies that attach to those entities, those identities, the entities of the identities, so to speak. So for British Columbia, 34 unique language groups. So in British Columbia, we would expect that there would be none less than 34 unique DRIPA implementation plans. As each nation group begins to put themselves into DRIPA, to bring themselves into focus.
And so for the DRIPA in British Columbia, I've suggested that all of us need to take our identity, pull out Indigenous peoples from the DRIP Act and put in our own identity. The Danuka people have rights. The Huron-Wendat people have rights. The Nklakapam people have rights. The Mi'kmaq people have rights. So it now becomes a clear focus on a nation population instead of this philosophical group. Over time, we can determine what those rights mean and how to actually protect those rights. There are so many deep values differences between what I would say is the Canadian government values, which is hard to really recognize what those values are, from the values that the Tanakh have. And so, for example, our intellectual property is not necessarily thought about just in, in business practices or, or as individual or corporate ownership. We have values that relate intellectual property to clans, societies, different groups are responsible for it. It includes our languages, our stories, our songs, everything about us. But that, again, is not necessarily recognized by the other governments. Indigenous intellectual property is core to our identity. So when we think about intellectual property law in Canada and the, the application of that law, it is not necessarily going to do what we need it to do for us. So for, for Tanakh intellectual property, it's really about protecting our identity. It's about protecting our identity, protecting the foundation for innovation, all of those things. But more critically, it is about our, our intellectual property, is about identity and all of the rights that connect to that identity. Indigenous people belong to nations, but live in communities, as noted. When we think about Indigenous peoples and the diversity of those peoples, we have to understand that the culture of the people is what connects them to the land and their language. Our cultures are the, the, the living embodiment of those two pieces. Now, for the Tanakha, we again recognize that every Tanakha has the, the right to their, their identity, has the right to be included in processes of governing. Now, it's challenging for us as Indigenous people right now, given that the majority of the process that we're subject to are not lined up with cultures. They're lined up with programs and services or political initiatives. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission resulted in a whole lot of craziness going on in Ottawa to react to those recommendations. And then they come at us by recommendation, rather than actually bringing the recommendations as a whole to each nation group. It's an insane relationship we have. And so we're suggesting to the federal government, you could actually move from having 700 program-based authorities to 88 statutory nation-based authorities for spending and reporting. And so we're collectively working as First Nations across Canada through a national data strategy to implement our self-government through data sovereignty. So we have, have managed to uh, uh, get the mandate through the First Nations Information Governance Center, a national corporation, to have the uh, uh, federal government support us to ensure that each nation, each nation achieves data sovereignty within their own worldview. And so that national finig in that work that they're going to be doing is driven by each region. And so in British Columbia, I am the director to the FNIC board. And in that, I support the engagement and the discussion with BC First Nations around what their needs are and what they want out of a BC First Nations data center. So over the next while, we're hoping that the 51 million that was promised from the federal government will be released as this election wraps up and that we can move on with this work so that we can start to actually empower nations to do the work that they need to do, to empower nations to become the data sovereignists that they are, to take control over their well-being so that they can provide services on and off reserve for all of their citizens, regardless of where they are. We no longer want to be partitioned by where we sit. We no longer want to be partitioned by other people's opinion or other people's definition of who we are. It is so important that the Tanakha are the ones to open our data, that we are the ones to define what a strong, healthy Tanakha is and to put those measurements in place and to share that with the world. That is self-determination. That is self-government. And it's through recognition of our governance, our identity, and then the subsequent shift in the way that the federal government and other governments relate to us, that we will occur or that we will achieve reconciliation over time. And so I put my hands up again to all of you and thank you for participating and thank you to the hosts for bringing us together today.
And I hope that this event brings about more change in relationship so that we can achieve that true equitable place in the future where every person matters. And we are starting to measure what matters. So thank you very much. Bye.